Coming up on Network Africa. Senegal prepares for its inauguration ceremony installing President-elect Basiru Diomaye Faye as the fifth president. Somalia makes significant change to its constitution, granting the president authority to appoint or dismiss the prime minister. Plus, to support survivors of sexual violence in South Sudan, the United Nations mission creates safe houses in Western Equatoria. Hello and welcome to the program today. I'm Layo Olarindi. We begin with stories and happenings that made headlines over the weekend. The Sudanese army claimed its first major advance in 10 months of war, regaining control of the city of Ondoman from the paramilitary rapid support forces. The army said late on Friday it had succeeded in connecting its two main bases in the city. Footage showed empty streets and roads were destroyed buildings and tanks. However, the rapid support forces has denied the army's advance. The RSF has been fighting the army for control of Sudan since April in a war that has killed thousands, displaced almost 8 million to and sparked warnings on farming. At least 18 people were killed and hundreds of homes were brought down after Cyclone Gaman dropped huge rainfall over the northern region of Madagascar. Drone footage recorded in Ambilobe shows flooded streets with submerged buildings and vehicles, as well as people walking among the damaged areas. Damaged local bridge was also filmed with sections collapsed underwater. According to a local media report, citing the National Bureau of Risk and Disaster Management, more than 20,000 people were displaced following the landfall of tropical cyclone Gammon. Crowds of pro-Palestinian demonstrators gathered in Johannesburg on Saturday to demand an immediate ceasefire in Gaza Strip and an end to what they called complicity of the U.S. in the conflict. Protesters waving Palestinian flags and beating drums while holding placards demonstrated outside the American embassy. We're here fighting for Palestinian land rights and sovereignty and to call out the U.S.'s complicity in the genocide. The protest in Johannesburg comes after the United Nations Security Council passed a draft resolution calling for a lasting, sustainable ceasefire in Gaza during Ramadan, which has passed 14 votes in favor, and the U.S. abstaining on Monday. Washington had vetoed three previous drafts. Uh, the complicity is almost the U.S. being Israel itself, because all of, or if not most of their funding has come from America, and they have bypassed and vetoed almost any resolution that has come up from the U.S. And yeah, they are very much complicit. Fighting in Gaza continues for the six months. Senegal is getting set for its presidential inauguration built to hold on Tuesday, the 2nd of April. President-elect Bastiru Diomaye Faye will be the country's fifth leader to be sworn in. Now, this is coming after the 44-year-old election victory was confirmed by the Constitutional Council last week. The top court validated provincial results announced on Wednesday based on vote tallies from 100% of polling stations. Mr. Faye, an anti-establishment candidate and ally of popular opposition figure Usman Sonko, won more than 54% of votes cast in last Sunday's delayed presidential poll. His closest competitor in the polls, ruling coalition candidate Ahmad Ba, who was handpicked by the outgoing President Macky Sall, took about 35% of the vote. The council said no objections had been raised by the other contenders. Now, at the age of 44, Mr. Fire becomes Africa's youngest president.
Let's speak now to the VOA's Africa Regional Correspondent and Nairobi Bureau Chief Mariama Diallo joining us from Dakar, capital of Senegal. Hello, Mariama. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to actually be in West Africa, just basically right on your neck of the woods. It's good to have you in West Africa. Now, how are preparations going for tomorrow's inauguration? I imagine much excitement and anticipation. Absolutely. To say the least, a lot of excitement, anticipation, obviously, uh, knowing what the country has been uh, going through the past few weeks, the past few months, after an attempt by the outgoing president, uh, Macky Sall, to postpone the elections uh, by 10 months to December. Uh, I think everybody just has been very, very excited. Uh, they've been amazingly uh, kind of surprised that the elections actually did take place uh, on March 24th. A new president has been elected and he's about to be sworn in. Uh, when you look at, when you talk about preparations and you look at the avenue, it's called the Avenue de la République, which, uh, which leads to the presidential palace. It's very well decorated. When you uh, also, uh, in that same area, make that left to, to head to the Place de l'Independence, uh, also very well, uh, nicely decorated. It's almost, it looks almost like Christmas, but it is decorated uh, with the Senegalese colors, as you can see the flag, uh, the green, uh, yellow and red, uh, which are the colors of the Senegalese flag, of course, uh, with that star uh, in uh, in the middle uh, of that flag. Yes, absolutely. Uh, lots of, I mean, it's Ramadan, obviously, uh, for the Muslims, and they're looking forward to end this month. Uh, but the Christians just uh, celebrated Easter. Uh, so I think, you know, the excitement uh, is just everywhere. It's, it's definitely popular. Now, at the age of 44, Basiru Diomayefai becomes Africa's youngest president. Now, what are the Senegalese people, you know, expecting from their new uh, young leader by the time he picks up his mandate? It's interesting you talk about his age at 44 years old, because I was just working on a piece today looking uh, into, you know, just Africa uh, in general and the, the lessons to be learned uh, from these latest elections in Senegal. And one country that I uh, touched on was Cameroon, Cameroon's name, uh, a neighboring country to you guys, uh, where you have a president uh, that is in his 90s, almost 91 years old. So the total opposite, like almost the double of the age uh, of this newly elected president. But, uh, you know, I think the expectations are high uh, from uh, the young people here. Uh, the leader has talked about, uh, Jamai Fai, Basir Jamai Fai has talked about uh, basically, uh, you know, trying to kind of tackle some of the, 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 the institutions, how they have been affected by what happened in the past few months. He's talked about tackling corruption. He's talked about also helping uh, to kind of alleviate this high cost of living. But I think for the youth, uh, it has a lot to do. I think every, most people that I spoke, uh, that I spoke to uh, during this coverage talked about jobs. It's jobs, jobs, jobs. Uh, a lot of these young kids are coming out of uh, universities or graduating, and there are no jobs for them. When you look at the, 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 you know, the clandestine immigration, where you have a lot of people in Senegal who are, who are using these boats, who are using these uh, ways to get into the West. Uh, it's very sad with a lot of people who are dying, families or losing um, uh, uh, family members. Uh, so I think for the young people, definitely, I think their priority has a lot to do with how to create jobs, how to occupy them, uh, how to uh, basically how they can, uh, uh, you know, what's, what the next stage of their lives uh, uh, has to look like. Uh, after graduating from university. Indeed, Mariama, and you touched a bit uh, on what I'm about to ask you next. You know, it had seemed impossible to where Senegal is now, the inauguration happening tomorrow because of the obstacles and, you know, delay that had surfaced. The outgoing president, Macky Sall, says he's going to leave in April, and now that appears to be the case. After two terms in office, what will he be remembered for? 
Well, I think uh, Macky Sall uh, has also, when you, when you think about uh, the ruling uh, coalition uh, party candidate was Amadou Ba. I mean, yes, uh, Basiru Jamai Faye won uh, by a little over 54%, uh, but Amadou Ba did win about 36% uh, of the vote. Uh, so if you look at uh, the people who are uh, Macky Sall's advocates, uh, they talked about infrastructure. They said that he's developed uh, uh, the infrastructure uh, here in Senegal while he was here. Um, they like him, they wanted, some of them even wanted him to continue. I mean, to literally <laughs> go over uh, the two terms, which, uh, you know, which is kind of unheard of in Senegal. Uh, the other thing for Macky Sall not to remember is also, uh, he's the one when he actually came into power, uh, the, the term was seven years and he actually was one of the first presidents to decide that he was going to shorten that term to five years so that it's a, it's a it's a shorter term. I think he'll be remembered for some of the stuff he's done, uh, obviously, but I think the end of his uh, term, uh, trying to postpone uh, those elections, uh, something that has never happened in Senegal, uh, you know, knowing the country, how it's had its transitions. You've had the Socialist Party that was there from independence, uh, you know, with President Senghor until the 80s, and then he left there, left uh, Abdul Juf, who was there until 2000. Abdullah Wad came in and, and, you know, won the elections. There was a transition. And then you had Macky Sall, who also won. When he won, when Wad was trying to stay, that was also another transition. Um, so I think him trying to play, I, I don't know what he was playing. I mean, a lot of people, obviously, his critics, accuse him of wanting to hold on to power. So I think the last few weeks, a few months of his uh, uh, his presidency will certainly tarnish uh, a reputation for his allies, the people who support him, uh, will, will just, you know, they are with him no matter what. But I think his critics um, certainly, uh, you know, history will judge him as somebody, uh, at least from his critics point of view, as someone who wanted uh, uh, to hold on to power. And Mariam, just quickly, one final question. You know, last week's election had a female candidate in the running, and she is the first woman to run for president in years in the country. What did she pull? Well, actually, I mean, as you were talking, I was just going to show you my little scribble here. You know, my handwriting uh, when I was taking, uh, I was at the court, the court of appeals, when they were giving those uh, uh, provisional results. And uh, Anta Baba Kangam had actually point. I mean, she had about fifteen thousand four hundred and fifty-seven votes, which uh, represents point uh, thirty-four percent of the vote. It looks very low, but uh, at the same time, there were 17 candidates. She was not the last one. Um, there are other candidates, other politicians who are a little uh, more seasoned politicians who actually scored low. Uh, and in those people, I'm thinking about uh, uh, Buna John, who had like 0.19%. Um, you had uh, Serin Bouk, who had I mean, a little bit 0.36%. You had Mr. Gak, who had 0.14%. Uh, so I think she did well for someone. It was her first time. She's very young. She's 39, uh, younger than uh, Basir Jamai Fai. So, uh, you know, I'm sure the political landscape is going to look at uh, what the next step is for her and uh, what she's going to uh, do, uh, you know, in five years' time. But maybe she doesn't need to wait uh, for uh, the next uh, presidential elections. Maybe she'll be involved uh, in other things, uh, maybe including this government. Who knows? Indeed. And, you know, this uh, one may say it helps in advancing the campaign to achieve gender equality on the continent. I mean, 15,000, eh, it's not so bad. <laughs> anyway, it's, not so uh, it's the first time. Yeah. It's the first know, time, like indeed. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much. Uh, VOA's Africa Regional Correspondent, Mariama Diallo. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, we're in Togo now after nearly a week of growing public 
discontent, the Togolese president has announced that the controversial constitutional reform bill will be tabled again in parliament and that will be for a second reading. The proposed constitution grants parliament the power to choose the president doing away with direct elections. Now this has faced criticism from opposition parties uh, who say it's a ploy to consolidate President Foray Asingbe's domination over the structure of power in Togo. The legislation was initially passed by parliament on March 25 and it makes uh, it likely that Mr. Yasingbe would be re-elected when his mandate expires in 2025. Activists and opposition leaders and uh, the Catholic Christian clergy have urged the president not to sign the bill into law. Welcome back to the program. Somalia has made significant changes to its constitution, granting the president the authority to appoint and dismiss the prime minister. The decision was approved by a substantial majority of parliament following debates within the Federal Assembly in Mogadishu. Now, the amendments were proposed by the Independent Constitutional Review and Implementation Commission, and this was also announced that the three draft provision concerning religion would undergo further review to be able to ensure alignment with Somali principles and values. Now, these amendments aim to address long-standing disputes in Somali politics, particularly power struggles between presidents and prime ministers that's often fueled by constitutional ambiguities. Now, one major change establishes that a president appointed prime minister uh, replacing the previous requirement for parliamentary confidence votes. The amendment constitution also introduces a five-year term for government bodies referring to regional state leaders as presidents and promotes a multi-party system in the country. To support some of the survivors of conflict-related sexual violence in South Sudan, the United Nations mission in the country and partners have opened a safe house in Andari in western Equatoria. The center intends to assist 195 survivors who are expected to undergo short sessions of psychosocial support counseling and trauma healing. They can also participate in livelihood skills, trainings aimed at restoring their dignity and setting them on a path of recovery and reintegration. Conflicts in South Sudan have led to traumatic experiences for many young women and men, not least the ones who have been forced to join different armed groups in the country. As part of looking for a durable and inclusive peace in South Sudan, we also have to bring survivors in so that they heal the trauma that they went through and that they will then become uh, productive uh, members of society contributing to the economic and uh, the social economic and uh, well-being of the state. Representatives of two armed groups in the Democratic Republic of Congo have signed solemn pledges to do better in respecting and protecting civilians. The signing ceremony held at the City Hall in Geneva, and this is the same hall where the first Geneva Convention was signed in the mid-19th century. With several Western diplomats in attendance, the envoys made commitments that their forces will work to end sexual violence, food insecurity, and conditions of famine and to ensure greater access to health care in parts of increasingly violent eastern Congo that they operate and control. Africa's second largest country, the DRC, has seen a recent upsurge in insecurity in its mineral rich east and territorial gains by the M23 rebel group that's allegedly linked to neighboring Rwanda. Now, the area has been riddled by conflicts for decades linked to more than 120 armed groups who are fighting for land and power and in some cases protecting their communities.
The UN Refugee Agency is raising the alarm as ongoing violence in the east of the Democratic Republic of Congo reach a devastating level. Renewed clashes between the Congolese army and the M23, a non-state armed group, have triggered massive displacement uh, in recent days. More and more people are arriving at overcrowded camps in the east of the country where there is lack of food, sanitation and shelter. Asifawe Peruzi and her eight children fled their home last December when fighting spread to their neighborhood. The family now lives at the Rosayo displacement site in Goma. We fled our homes because of fighting. It first started in Mushaki. We thought it would not spread to our area because there were so many soldiers there. We felt safe. Later, the soldiers left and we were worried about our safety. We started hearing gunfire and bombing in the hills. Many bullets were fired near our home area. In recent weeks, a staggering 297,000 people have arrived in the provincial capital of Goma, North Kivu province. Many live in poor and cramped conditions with little or no access to food, health services and education. I fled with my six children while bombs and gunshots were resounding. Since we arrived here, we haven't received any assistance and we're hungry and do not know what to do. The health of my child is worrying. I am terrified and stressed. For my child to be in this severe state means she's getting very little healthy food. Since the eruption of renewed violence on the night of the 18th of March 2022 in the North Kivu province between government forces and non-state armed groups, the conflict has inflicted a staggering toll on civilian populations. Aid agencies have raised alarm about the increase in civilian casualties and the use of heavy weapons in populated areas in recent weeks. Since violent clashes enveloped Sake in Masisi territory on the 7th of February, almost 300,000 people have arrived in Goma and its surroundings, swelling spontaneous and official displacement sites as they desperately seek shelter from indiscriminate bombing and other human rights abuses. Conditions are dire as growing needs for shelter, sanitation and livelihood opportunities outstrip available resources. A further 85,000 people have fled that same violence and sought shelter in Minova, South Kivu. In January, the town of Minova already hosted over 156,000 displaced people with the majority in makeshift shelters. Some UNHCR teams are bleak. Families continue arriving at sites traumatized and exhausted by the attacks, scarred physically and psychologically. Many report being abused, some sexually, during their flight. According to the World Food Programme, around a quarter of DRC's population, 23.4 million people, are facing crisis levels of hunger or worse. <laughs> We, as the World Food Programme, we have to be there to give food assistance, to give cash, to make sure that these families don't face hunger, these mothers don't turn around and say, I have no food to feed my children. And we also have to keep telling the international community, don't give up on these people, don't ignore these people, and don't let this situation be tolerated. Far from the country's capital, Kinshasa, eastern Congo has long been overrun by more than 120 armed groups seeking a share of the region's gold and other resources while carrying out massacres. The result is one of the world's largest humanitarian crises, with an estimated 7 million people displaced, many of whom are beyond the reach of aid. Well, back here in Nigeria, residents of Lagos are still in Easter mood with children taking time out to participate in the yearly Easter fiesta organized by the state government. The event held at the Lagos House, Alausa Ikeja. <laughs> It's fun time for these children who are privileged to attend the Lagos State 2024 Family Easter Fiesta at the Lagos House of Lausa Ikeja. Happy, happy, happy. 
All kinds of games and other fun activities are available for them to have the most memorable Easter celebration. It is an annual event organized by the office of the First Lady, Dr. Ibijoke Sonwolu, who is also here alongside the wife of the Deputy Governor, Mrs. Uluremi Hamzad, to celebrate with the children. While they have fun, parents in attendance listen to a message on the power of resurrection. Resurrection, when we talk about resurrection, it is, we're talking about when Jesus Christ when Jesus Christ was arrested, Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He came to this world. We celebrated his birthday. Now it's time to celebrate the pupils and also give them a sense of belonging. The cognitive, affective, and also the psychomotor aspects. And which has to do with the total learning process of our children. We read. We know, we recognize certain things, and then we also practicalize them. That's the whole essence of learning. The essence of the program is just to encourage the students to bring them close, to let them have a feel that they are well recognized and they are expected to behave well, to know that the future of this country uh, belongs to them. They should have sense to give them sense of belonging it's not about the older people alone governance is inclusive mrs amzat reads the first lady's speech highlighting the need for children to imbibe the spirit of tolerance and peaceful coexistence this is the advice for our mommy beyond the celebration i encourage you not to lose track of the significance of the easter season i urge you all to invite the track of spirit of the spirit of tolerance, peace coexistence, and sacrifice for one another. You have to love and one another, be a good help to each another. You have to make sure that you stay away from sin. Always help mommy, help daddy. You always, 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 always have to be humble. No dull moment at all for the children as they are engaged in several competitions and gift items are presented to the lucky winners. The family Easter fiesta was introduced by Mrs. Sonwolu in 2021 as a landmark event in line with the essence of the season and has been sustained over the years. And that's it on the program. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Layo Olarinde. Have a lovely Easter.